Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Andrew. We're going to go on now to, uh, to Terry. Over to you, Terry. Hi, uh, my name is Terry Angler. I'm the uh, president of ILW Local 400, which represents the unlicensed uh, workers, deckhands, cook deckhands, cooks on board tugboats on uh, our coast. Uh, I've been uh, working on tugboats since 1976. Um, and I was actually, a number of years ago, about 15 years ago, involved in a, uh, a fairly minor uh, spill. Uh, and we were taking a load of fuel to Alaska, and we were going through Wrangell Narrows, which uh, is a very uh, difficult uh, place to, to go through, uh, a lot of hazards. And uh, we went through at night and had a spill. Fortunately, we were carrying a fuel called 50 Below, which is a kerosene derivative that stays liquid at 50 below zero. So uh, we had a single hull barge, which was what the norm at that time, and a number of the tanks. Each of the fuel barges, they're not one, one large tank. There's like a dozen tanks. And that was one of the ways of mitigating a problem that you wouldn't necessarily uh, take out all the tanks. Uh, we didn't, there was a couple tanks. Uh, the, by the morning, the fuel was gone. There was nothing you could see, you could smell it in the air because it's a, a, a fuel that uh, basically evaporates unless it's really, really cold. Um, one of the things that happened after that, fairly shortly after that, uh, af after we had that spill, the rules changed and uh, the rules uh, should have never been, we should never have gone through there at night. Um, after that, basically the rules were you don't go through Wrangell Narrows except for uh, during the daylight hours if you're not familiar. The locals did, did try to go through that area, but people that weren't familiar shouldn't have gone through there. There was no pilot on board the tug as well, as that wasn't required up there. So that was the way things, things were. Uh, one of the things we do with, with uh, tugs in this, we basically supply the whole, the Vancouver Island up and down the coast. Uh, a lot of communities, the only way they get anything, they get fuel, uh, most of their supplies is, is on the water. And in fact, uh, using the water as a transportation system is the most efficient and the most environmentally sensitive way of doing it. A barge can take uh, 20, 30, 50 truckloads. And so if you take a barge from uh, Delta Port and then you run a, a, a barge past, uh, up to Mission, you bypass all the roads, all, all the uh, bridges, uh, you've taken a lot of trucks off the road, it's a very efficient and environmentally sensitive way of moving materials. In fact, it is the history of uh, moving things on the water goes is probably the oldest way, oldest method of uh, of transportation for human beings. So, it's something that we don't utilize well enough here in the Lower Mainland. We we use trucks. The South Perimeter Road is an issue that we have real issues with. They're they're damaging an environmental system when in fact it would be much more efficient to move that, move that material on barges uh, past the pinch points through so that you don't have all these trucks running through the neighborhoods. Uh, Europeans do this much better than we do and there's lots of statistics about the savings in terms of greenhouse, greenhouse gases, uh, in terms of the pollutants and congestion on the roads. It's, uh, it is really one of the most efficient man, uh, means of transportation and our coast requires that we use the waters to do that. Uh, it's just, uh, it is the most efficient way of doing it. One of the things it provides is uh, good living wage jobs and I thank Bill for pointing that, that piece out. Right now we've had, um, we've lost a lot of real jobs in this province. The mill towns have shut down. The uh, logs, log, logging mills, sawmills, pulp mills, those jobs were the kind of jobs that um, people could get out of high school, immigrants could get. Uh, you didn't need to have a degree in some way or another, and you could make a good, good living wage. Now, these, we've lost all those jobs. We still have them mostly, in, in, at least on the marine side of transportation. Our members make a good, a good wage. They have, uh, uh, they're able to, to make a living, support a family, and one of the things we did a few years ago, uh, 
when things looked to be booming before the great the crash that happened a couple years ago, we approached some First Nations communities, and uh, because of the incredibly high unemployment levels in these communities, and because the kind of work we do, we work two weeks on, two weeks off. So you can live wherever you want and work on a tugboat. You can live, we have members that live in Kamloops. We have members that live, we have a, we have a member that lives in Texas uh, at times. So you can live wherever you want and still work and make a good living wage. It fits perfectly into the scenario for a lot of First Nations communities because they don't really want to lose their people from their reserves but they do need some economic stimulation so that the, the people see possibilities and have hopes. We went to them and said, we will, we will accept you as family. The same way we do our children that come, they're, they're, we, we view them we, as someone that will give you an advantage, will help you out. Um, unfortunately, the industry crashed. So it was, it was a bit hollow. We didn't know it would be because we thought things were growing. And, and we still intend to do that. So it's, these jobs are important. Um, one of the things that, one of the concerns that we have is regulation.